Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started, if you guys could settle down. So before I jump in, let me do two housekeeping announcements. First, uh, many of you have said this privately, but just officially say once while I've got y'all here for this last big talk that I'm giving. Uh, I'm at the Free Market Institute, which is located at Texas Tech University, and it's a PhD granting program. So if you're interested in getting a PhD in economics and you wanna study with faculty and even do a dissertation that you know, is Austrian, then we're a program you might wanna check out. We have funding and so forth. So I just wanted to officially say, you know, the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech, check that out if, if that uh, pertains to you. The other housekeeping announcement, just wanna talk about this for a second. So this, yeah. All right, so th this isn't a joke. There's good, there's good news and there's bad news. We just wanna be transparent. Unlike the uh, GOP healthcare approach, we're gonna be fully transparent here. So the good news, I just wanna make sure you know what this is. It's not like these are students who love Austrian economics and they also like to play around with a guitar in the garage once in a while. These are professional musicians coming in. They play in California, New York City, uh, Nashville, and they've come here for this event. They also happen to be libertarians and love Austrian economics and economics in general. That's why they associate with me. And so that, that's what they're here. But again, this, these are professional musicians that the show we're going to put on. The, the problem is, we just found out about this yesterday, there's an issue, I'm hoping it doesn't matter, we're, I'm still gonna talk to the owner, but it's possible that with the venue, they're, they're having some trouble with the city and the fire code, and so it's conceivable that we can't get everybody in there all at the same time. So what we're doing is, for sure, if you're going, bring your name badge, so that, because we're telling the bouncers, okay, make sure the only people you let in are our people to at least make sure it's all our group. I'm not saying you have to wear it, like, you know, walking around on a Friday night, I like Austrian economics. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, you, girls, you can put it in your purse along with the six billion other things you have in there. I don't really understand that situation. But, okay, so I just want to make sure. So if, especially, it, it's a, the, the venue is going to be great. I don't, I'm not trying to discourage you. It's going to be awesome. We've got a nice stage. There's a big dance floor. So especially if you're eager to dance tonight, come out. But the sooner you get there, you know, the, the better in terms of making sure we get in there. Uh, and also... If you do happen to get there and you can't get it, I mean, there's plenty of stuff in Auburn on a Friday night. Where this place is, it's literally right around the corner from where Sky Bar is, for those of you who've been going out there, right? So if you get there and you can't get in right that moment, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can be doing maybe l l later somebody else will be. It's, it's sort of like fractional reserve banking, unfortunately, all right? <laughs> fractional reserve concert. All right. Okay, so today we're talking about the market for security. Just to clarify what this is, it's... Uh, you know, a lot of these ideas we've been talking about privatization of things, and sometimes you know you take the logic and say, "All right," you get a lot of people say, "Yeah, sure, I get post office clearly free market incentives work there, entrepreneurship you don't need a monopoly, even roads not a big deal, schools clearly okay, all this stuff you can think about charity sure thing, but a lot of people when it comes to the, the law, you know, police protection, legal opinions, legal rulings, so forth, it seems like that clearly has to be something issued by a monopoly agency, right? And military defense also, that seems like something where, yikes, I don't know about, you know, just turning that over to the free market, that seems kind of scary, All right? So this is, we do this later in the week, and you know, we don't want to scare you away early on. Um, I think at this point, most people are, are familiar with this, it's not so radical. I do want to say, though, it was about, this was over 10 years ago, uh, I, w I went to Mises, I was still a, a grad student at the time, and it was like Wednesday night or something, and people are all sitting around talking, and there was this woman who was middle-aged that was, you know, there, attending and and she in the middle of the conversations I mean the stuff I'm hearing in this place is pretty radical it's like this sounds like anarchy and everyone <laughs> was like awkward you know so <laughs> all right so let's go ahead and just, let me just say as a blanket uh, announcement I mean it is I'm going to try to focus on the 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 positive case, in other words, like, like building the stuff up and showing you how it would work. But again, for those of you who went to my economics of the stateless society talk, it, it's funny that the, the burden of proof is on us. Now, now here, it's more understandable why that's the case, but all the problems we have with monopoly and having the political system in charge of some service, that all still applies here. So it's always the case when you know, you're in this situation thinking about one versus the other, there are all those standard reasons why other things equal. You would certainly want to have a service provided not by one group that's suddenly ordained to have the monopoly and be in charge of this. And also, think of it this way, if you would be leery about letting the state be in charge of wheat production or health care, 
You know, because, oh, geez, those are really important things. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't a bunch of politicians in charge of whether I get fed or not. It's odd that you're going to let a bunch of politicians be in charge of whether you go to be inside a cage for the rest of your life or whether you get shipped off to war or whether they're going to protect you from incoming ballistic missiles, right? These are pretty important things too. And so it's weird that if you wouldn't trust them to be in charge of lollipop production because they would screw it all up, they can be in charge of nuclear weapons, all right? So I'll say that just as the outset to frame it, but now I will take you know, these obvious objections head on, because again, this is obviously more difficult, both conceptually and practically, than some of the other things like having mail delivery be privately produced. Another thing just that confuses people sometimes, there is, uh, so I personally am very sympathetic to pacifism coming from the Christian tradition, and sometimes that confuses people. They say, Bob, you wrote a lot about private law and, and military defense, but I thought you, there, there really is nothing, there's no contradiction there. And the reason I'm stressing it is just because I want to make sure part of what you get from Mises U is the distinction between what libertarian theory says and what your own personal value system is. So let me just quickly use an analogy. I also, with my value system, think that being a heroin addict is immoral, right? That you're wasting the gifts God has given you and so on. Libertarian theory doesn't say it should be a crime to use heroin, right? So libertarian theory says you can't put someone in jail or use other kinds of physical force to prevent someone from using heroin or being a heroin addict, but that doesn't mean we have to say, hey, I'm not judging, do whatever you want, right? It's not just like the difference between vanilla and chocolate ice cream. It, it could be. I can't prove to you necessarily that it isn't like that, but the point is libertarian theory per se isn't about that sort of question, just about the acceptable use of force in certain situations. When are you allowed to use force to stop somebody from doing something? So I personally, even though I'm gonna be talking about this stuff, uh, would, would not probably pay a lot of money to private defense agencies that are gonna use missiles and so forth in a free society, and I would be free to do that. I wouldn't be taxed to fund something. But as an economist, I can tell you what I think the market would likely look like. Just like as an economist, I could say if they legalize drugs tomorrow, here's what the market would look like. Well, they probably wouldn't legalize it on a Saturday. They'd probably wait till Monday. But if they legalize drugs on Monday, I could tell you as an economist what that market would look like, and it certainly wouldn't be me endorsing the consumers in that market. I'm just telling you what it would look like. All right. So I'm going to spend more time, I think, in this talk on private law rather than private defense, because to me, the conceptual challenge with this stuff comes with, with private law. Right, that, whereas if you, if you stipulate that framework, if you just for a minute assume you could have voluntary relationships when it comes to legal rulings and so forth, or, or at least what would that mean to talk about introducing competition in the legal system, how could that work? I think that's the thing where there's the real stumbling block, right? Just the idea of the rule of law sounds like there's got to be one agency that promulgates it, whereas military defense, that seems more like a practical problem and so that's, that's part of the emphasis I'm going to give here in this talk. Uh, before I forget, let me just mention, in case you want further reading, because at the end I might be rushed and I, I might forget to say it. So Ethics of Liberty is a great spot for this um, sort of thing. Uh, Hans Hoppe has essays on pr private defense. Um, I have a pamphlet called Chaos Theory you can look up. I also have at Mises.org an essay um, called The Possibility of Private Law. Okay, so that's some reading where if, I'm, here I'm obviously going to have to just skim over some of these topics quickly just to give you a broad taste of it, but those are some things for further reading. Okay, one way of trying to approach this is I want to disarm you a little bit, because admittedly, things like, gee, the, 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 you want to have the rule of law, right? It's, it seems crazy. How could there possibly be 19 different legal codes? Like it's, I can see how there'd be competition in the fast food industry. And you've got you know, Burger King, you've got Taco Bell, you've got all this stuff, but it seems weird. What, what does it even mean to say that we don't want a state monopoly when it comes to the legal code? So let me try to get you out of that mindset by showing you we don't have a monopoly in other areas uh, where that same objection superficially might seem to work, but then it, it, it's pretty silly, you can see, all right? So for example, when it comes to the science, right? So something like physics, we don't have a monopoly. It's not like there's a world government body that says this is what the acceptable body is that promulgates physics. Physics is, is a science, a field of open entry, right? And so, but notice it's not haphazard. 
Right? You could go around, there, there is a, a fact of the matter, or a consensus, let's put it that way, of who the authorities are, right? That word authority, we could say there are authorities when it comes to physics right now, but it's clearly not based on coercion, right? It's not that they're in charge because ultimately they have more guns than anybody else. And I don't want to dwell too long on it right now, and also even scientists might ultimately disagree philosophically about what's the nature, what constitutes that authority, how do they get it, and how do they demonstrate it, and why do people defer to them? But I hope we can all agree that yes, there are people who are the community would recognize and say they know a lot about physics and these other people don't. And even within the physicists themselves, of course there might be a peddling rivalries and they might disagree and say, this guy's a genius and somebody else say, nah, he's a fraud or what. But there they would just, they would be petty personal disagreements. They would realize that yes, this person knows the standard stuff. He knows basic physics compared to some person off the street. All right, and again though, notice that there's, there's no coercion involved there. And, and it, even though, and also throughout history, times when science has been politicized, and we've seen this even in, in relatively free Western countries, right, with climate change debate and so on, but there's more famous examples, the Soviet Union and biology and, and so on, about the politicization of science, and clearly that's not good for science, right? So the scientists themselves recognize you ultimately don't want state coercion involved in this stuff, they might you know, say, oh, I want to get my subsidies and so on, but that's just because you know, they want money. You can see how though, having political authorities say who are the good scientists and who are bad, that even scientists would recognize that wouldn't be a good idea. And of course, I think we all recognize throughout history that wasn't necessary. All right, so you might say, okay, fine. I grant you, you don't need this monopoly agency in charge of running science. And, and yet, notice science is very orderly. Okay, it, it's, it improves over time. I think we all agree that scientists know more now about physics and chemistry than the scientists from 1800 did. So there's definite progress there. There's open entry. So there's clearly a sense of, of freedom into the field of science. So typical arguments about why we need one group in charge of issuing legal pronouncements or deciding who owns that house over there you realize, well, okay, if you thought that, if you thought there needs to be one group that has a monopoly to be able to say who's the legal owner of that house across the street, because otherwise it would be anarchy and people would be fighting and there would be no consensus. We wouldn't know. This group would say, Jim Smith owns that house. And, and I'm saying, if, that sounds superficially plausible. Like, yeah, how could private legal systems work if different people are claiming? And I'm, so again, I'm, what I'm just trying to say is notice how silly that worry would be in the context of science. That, well, gee, what if some physicists are saying that the moon has more mass than the sun and other ones are saying, how would we know? Right, are we gonna go measure it? Ha, ha, ha. That, that would be silly. You would realize, well, yeah, maybe you couldn't really explain how they do know, but you're, I think you realize that, yeah, physicists are pretty sure about which is more massive than the other, and there's no real fundamental disagreement on that. They didn't need to settle it with you know, guns back in 1972. They settled that question, right? Just like Tom and I like how sometimes people talk about states' rights, and they say, wasn't that settled by the Civil War? Like, what kind of argument is that? But all right, that's a separate thing. Okay, now you might say, all right, I get your analogy, Murphy, with, the, with science, but, the, but the, the reason that's not a great analogy is that science, you know, those are laws of nature that you're talking about. So there's experimental evidence. If one physicist is saying one thing and somebody else is saying something else, there's experiments, there's, you know, you can make observations, it's empirical. And so that's not really a great analogy for private legal rulings where it, you know, to say who owns that house, that's not like a fact of the world the way the mass of the moon is kind of an objective fact. So that's not really a great analogy. Okay, what about then the definitions of words? That's clearly not a fact of nature. That's a human convention, right? Humans, through our actions, our, our speaking patterns and writing patterns, we determine collectively in some sense what words mean. Right? And notice, it evolves over time. If you try to read Shakespeare, it's clearly English, but it's a different kind of English from what people write now, I mean, with their LOLs and so forth, right? So you see how language evolves over time, but yet, at any, does that mean, oh, it's just anarchy, you can say whatever you want? No, at any given time, there is a fact of the matter to say, is this sentence grammatical? There's a fact of the matter, okay? And now, also, I mean, you can push this analogy as far as you want, and actually, I think language is a pretty good analogy for legal codes because it has all the ad or has several of the attributes that you would want where there's clear cut cases you know say i've done gone to the store today that's that's clearly not grammatical 
right? But if somebody says, oh, who'd you go to the store with? Some people might say, oh, that's ungrammatical. You can't end a sentence with a preposition. Other people would say, eh, actually, a lot of people do it. And, you know, the, the usage has, has made it change. It's fine. Or with whom shall I go to the store today? You know, some people said, ah, you can say with who. It's fine, right? So I'm saying it's, there's, there's disagreements there. And at any given time, some people might be sticklers. But th so it's, I think it's very analogous to private law where there's certain things that are clear cut that if the community is gonna recognize immediately, any expert in the field is gonna say, yeah, you're just out in the park and some mother's pushing her baby in the stroller and you pick up a, a rock and go and drop it on the baby, <laughs> that's illegal, that's against the law, right? <laughs> and, and no serious legal scholar is gonna say otherwise. And you, know, you could say, well, how would you know that? Well, how do you know to say, I done gone to the store today is wrong? You know it's wrong, how do you know it's wrong? You know what I'm saying? So, uh, it's we can get real philosophical, but there's no doubt that just going and dropping rocks on babies is wrong. Okay, I mean unless the baby attacked you. But mm. all right. So the, by the way, one the baby crawling out there, he's got a lot of drool going on. So I'm just saying it's I don't want to get on this jacket. All right. So okay, but I'm being serious. You, so you see there, whereas it's sort of like okay, what if somebody you know is running at me with a with a knife, can, and you know, can I punch him or something? And I think probably most legal scholars in the kind of culture that we're talking about, with a lot of this, let's assume we're talking about the United States, if everyone read Rothbard all of a sudden and, and just went anarcho-capitalist, what kind of legal system would arise in that framework? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about right now. So in some other culture where people had vastly different religious views, and it, it might be different what a private legal system would produce, but I'm, I have in mind something like Western Europe or the United States, if the major change was simply, they thought, oh yes, we don't need to use coercion in the legal system, let's try to make everything voluntary with a market. But other than that, they had their same opinions about property rights, all right? So in that kind of a framework, I believe at least early on, in the first few decades of that type of a system, clearly all the reputable judges, the ones who had business who were working as judges, would agree if somebody is run up to me with a knife and is trying to kill me and I, you know, pop them or something that that's not, I haven't committed a crime. They say, no, that's justifiable self-defense. Now where they might start this, what if somebody's running up to me and they're, they don't have any weapon and I pull out a gun and shoot them in the head, now it starts to get a little bit grayer, right? That's kind of like saying, do I have to say with whom shall I go to the store? And some people might disagree. Okay, but so I'm, I'm trying to show you that that's the kind of disagreements where there would be. So it's not that when I say there would be a fact of the matter and consensus, I mean on real standard, easy to answer black and white questions, and then there would be gray areas. But notice, in, in case that troubles you, you're like, aha, see, there wouldn't be a rule of law in your system. You're already admitting there'd be, well, there's disagreement right now, right? If you go, in, even in the United States, there's not the rule of law, meaning the same rules apply to everybody. In certain states, you can get the death penalty. In other states, you can't, okay? In certain states, uh, one type of thing might be a crime altogether. In other states, it might, like the legal drinking age or something could be different theoretically. Okay, so notice there's not the rule of law. And certainly if you start going from country to country around the world, things are different. Okay, so introducing the state and that apparatus doesn't give us the rule of law anyway. The way, if, if what you mean by that is every single human being has to have the same laws applied to them. And uh, later in the lecture, I might come back to this point, but when you start thinking through, okay, yeah, but I really would like as much as possible for there to be consensus in the same rules, I think actually a market would give you that more, more so than the state system. Because with the state system, often what can happen is the groups in contiguous regions might have elections that only pertain there, and then, the, and then they, the representatives could go past law. So you could have fundamental differences from this state to that state. Like, can, can places sell beer on Sunday and you just go two miles and all of a sudden the rules totally change, right? And so that kind of thing I don't think would differ, just like you know, um, opinions on grammar and so on, you wouldn't think would have such quick, sharp distinctions. If you just go two miles one way and all of a sudden things are totally different, generally speaking. Okay, you might say, all right, I get your, your dictionary analogy. L let me say one more thing about this, because this is, again, I think the best analogy for picking something that's obvious we can all think about. What, what does a dictionary itself do, right? The actual dictionary, the publishers of dictionaries, are they defining words, right? So if Webster's publishes a new 
edition, and it comes out, and you look up the word up, U-P, and it says moving towards the floor. Would you say, huh, I had no idea. <laughs> right? You wouldn't do that. You would say they got the definition wrong. What a bunch of idiots. And, you, and people would like, tweet it around and make fun of them. Nobody would say, I, was, I stand corrected. They would all be making fun of, look at this stupid typo that somehow slipped through their editing process. Webster's gets the, de the definition wrong. All right? They would be a laughing stock. They would have to quickly correct it. What if for some reason they didn't? And what if, um, what if that error or that type of error was, was for more obscure words where it wasn't obvious to people what the word meant, but actually they were giving what the experts said what the heck? No, that's clearly not what that word means, right? Like, what if they had oxymoron, Paul Krugman, right? <laughs> that might seem plausible to many people, but you'd realize, no, that's not the definition. What is it? So what would happen, Webster's would go out of, diction, or go out of business. They would stop being the go-to people that publish dictionaries. It's not that all of a sudden people wouldn't know what words meant. It just means that company would go out of business. They would have, for some foolish reason, squandered their position and some other authority would rise to fill the vacuum and people would go to them, okay? So I, again, notice there, it's not that the people publishing dictionaries or style manuals for, you know, for grammar usage, or you know, when you, uh, you're writing a term paper and you say, oh gee, let me go see, the teacher wants me to use the Chicago manual and you go look up, how do I cite you know, things for the works that I cite? What's the format? Do I put the author for it? Do I put it the date parentheses? What do I, that stuff, yeah, there are, there are facts of the matter, there are conventions, but Again, if somebody botched that and started just saying stuff that was totally wrong, they would, they would fall away. And notice also, that, again, there's competition within there. It provides uniformity, but then if there's some new standard that arises and eventually people say, yeah, actually, that's more convenient, right? I've even noticed that in my career, the way we cite papers has changed, right? It, now you just do like the author's name and the year in parentheses. It looks kind of ugly compared to the old school way but it's more efficient, right? It's easier just to look things up that way than having a footnote or something and saying Ibid. That's just cool. You guys flip back 19 pages to see what's the Ibid referring to, all right? So, um, so again, that's, it might seem like I'm saying something kind of trivial, but that's a crucial point that Paul Krugman is not an oxymoron right now. Uh, the crucial point is that the, the companies that codify these things, that's what they're doing. They're codifying definitions. They're saying what the community knows these definitions are through their usage patterns, all right? So similarly, in a private legal system, if some judge has people come before him or her arguing a case, what is the judge doing? The judge is rendering an opinion, right? Notice that's the, that's the actual word we use. Even in our current system, the judge writes an opinion saying, this is my interpretation of the relevant facts of this case and how the law applies to this particular dispute. That's what a judge does in principle, in essence, and that's what they, a judge would do even in a private legal system. All right, so I'll come back to this in a minute. So how, how would the judge know what the law was? Well, they would go to school, just like now, how do experts in grammar know what the right word usage is? Well, because they study it and so on, and there's books written on it by authorities, but again, no, but it's not that any one group has the power to make definitions. They're merely codifying things, even though the community over time does have the power to change definitions, right? We as English speakers kind of control what English words mean by the way we use them, and that's how language can evolve over time, just as in a private legal system, it would have to evolve too, right? That in the year 1500, they didn't have property rights regarding radio spectrum. They wouldn't even know what that was whereas there is some scarcity involved, and so there's an issue of, am I, am I stealing something if I have like a pirate radio station, right? So I'm not taking a stance on those issues, but clearly that's something that the legal system would have to talk about once people began using radios and broadcasting signals, and then if somebody else was interfering with it, you know, there was, there was some issue there about, do we need property rights in the electromagnetic spectrum? So the legal system would have to evolve too, and so I'm saying that just because that happens doesn't mean, therefore, oh, there's got to be some group in charge of it with a monopoly. It doesn't mean that. Okay, you might say, okay, fine. You know, you, yes, the, the dictionary, that's a better analogy, or language is a better analogy than, than science, natural science was. But the other problem, Murphy, with, with this thing is there's not a lot at stake. You know, the definition of up it's not like billions of dollars stand to change hands based on that. And so you wouldn't expect Webster's to be corrupt, that their business is just codifying language just to help us communicate. It's not, there's not really a big issue there. Whereas property titles, 
the people in charge of defining who is the owner of that house, that's a big deal. And so we might worry about corruption there. Well, I mean, yes, that is true. So that's why the analogy is not perfect. It's not that spoken language is literally the same thing as property titles. But let me push that. Do you really think, so here I've got just various definitions of physical constants. So what if I have a contract with somebody and I say, I'm going to spend, I agree, I'm going to spend 10 ounces of gold to buy three cows. And so then the guy gives me his three cows and I give him, you know, an, an ounce of silver. And he says, what are you doing? The contract said, I said, oh no, when I wrote 10, 10 to me is what, what you think of as this. I just use a different definition. And yeah, for me, gold, that's not the yellow thing you think of. I'm thinking of the silver thing. So there you go. Or, or I would hold up the silver coin and say, this is gold to me. That's what I would say. That'd be right. So and suppose I get my brother-in-law to agree and say, yes, I'm, the, uh, I'm Earl, the uh, person in charge of definitions and weights and measures in this jurisdiction. And I agree that that's what, that's what those words mean. Is Earl going to be a reputable member of the community who people are going to listen to when he says that what 10 means is this quantity? Right? No, no one's going to listen to him. All right? And even if somehow like if we had enough guns and we're pointing it and say, everyone agrees, right? right? And they're like, yeah. It, everyone inside is going to know these guys are just stealing from us. Okay, So it's not going to be where the community says, geez, we just don't know what 10 means. Huh? There's, there's an honest disagreement. No, everyone's going to know what 10 means and that they got ripped off. And so I, I, I'm saying, just like with dropping the rock on the baby in the park and so on, there's going to be standard things of the legal code that the community will know. All right? And it's, we, yes, we can get real philosophical and say, well, how do they know that, man? It, yes, that's an important question, but you know it's wrong to drop a rock on a baby, and you know some guy paid money to the people, the person that everybody thought owned that land got wood and so forth, lumber, built a house, and da, 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 all these things, and that's been in the family for six generations, and someone else walks up who's never been around and says, oh, that's my house, and I have 15 guys with guns who agree with me. Maybe he's going to get away with it just out of fear, but no one's going to think there's some honest disagreement now with the property titles. Okay, There's going to be clear-cut black and white cases that everyone's going to agree on, and yeah, there will be borderline cases of disagreement, and you'll need expert opinion, and, so, and judges might even overturn other judges' opinions, but that happens right now, right? So it's not that introducing the state solves the problem of genuine, honest disagreement. Getting rid of a monopoly, though, does allow the fact that when there's clear-cut cases where true experts all agree on something, we can at least be sure the legal code will endorse that, whereas right now there's all kinds of crazy stuff that people with their common sense know is absurd and unjust, and yet that goes through as legal. Okay, let's give it walk through a specific example, the TV thief. All right, at some point I'm going to have to change this because people are going to be like, what's a TV? But <laughs> you guys do know what a TV is, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I come home and I see somebody walking out of my uh, apartment and they, they have a TV and, and they run away and I get inside and my TV's gone. All right, so what do I do? I have footage on the camera showing the person leaving. It looks like... It's my neighbor who lives down the street from me. I'm pretty sure I know. I go and I peek in, and he now is looking at a TV that looks very similar to the one that I just had stolen. Okay, so what do I do? I, I could now, in terms of standard libertarian theory and probably your own personal moral code, if I'm absolutely sure that that's my TV, I, can, I have the right to just you know, kick in the door and say, give me my TV, and a guy says no, and I can go and, and grab it. And it, there's, there's question about what can I do? Like, what if he, you know, says, over my dead body? I'm like, oh, yeah? No. <laughs> so there's a question about what could I do if he really tries to get in my way and stop me. But clearly, if it's truly my TV, I can go take it back. But the question, but, but that's, that's not really the issue, right? So if I did that, right, if I just kicked the door in or if I went to um, some, uh, some agency that has a bunch of real burly guys who have flak jackets and stuff, and said, hey, this guy stole my TV, they're not just going to follow me down and I might say so, kick in the guy's door and go re re uh, retrieve it because the community might say, whoa, what are you doing? You're stealing that guy's TV, Murphy. What are you? Right? So I need to first prove to the community or demonstrate good faith that that really is my TV. Not, again, because of some deep-seated moral reason. I might be absolutely sure that it is my TV, and, and so long as I'm right, I think most people in their moral system would agree, yeah, I can go retrieve my actual TV from the thief, 
But the question is, that would be reckless. That would be a silly thing to do in a community. And there also might be contractual things. Like if I'm living in a gated community, I mean, there might be things I sign going into it saying, in the event of a serious dispute with one of your neighbors, you agree to submit to arbitration. You know, you, there could be stuff like that. So it's not so much from a natural rights reason, but perhaps I've signed something saying in a situations like this, I'm agreeing ahead of time on how to handle it. But even if I don't have such a contract that, that pertains, nonetheless, in the interest of getting along with the community and not making people worry that maybe I'm a hothead, it would be good for me to, to do it the right way, go through the proper channels. So what would I do? I would amass as much evidence as I could. If I had the video footage, I have the receipt from Best Buy when I bought that TV, the, 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 all the stuff I can do. And then I would, there would be experts available who specialize in uh, you know, s small amounts of theft, right? That there'd be certain experts who specialize in labor disputes. If, if employees think they're not being paid enough or their vacation times, there'd be employees who's, or judges who specialize in, uh, you know, products, some the product blows up on you or something, you get a shock from the other you know, be people in that environmental law. There'd be all sorts of different experts in various areas. So I would go to somebody who was listed, who is reputable, known in the community for excellence and fairness in rulings pertaining to cases like breaking and entering and you know small amounts of property theft. So I would go present all the evidence. I would, perhaps I would even say to the person, my neighbor, say, okay, look at here's something, there's 10 people in this zip code who specialize in this. I'm willing to take my case to any one of them, you pick. And with the person, no, no, I'm not doing it. No, that's just, those guys are a bunch of frauds. I don't trust them. No, I don't trust judges. Now I'm getting more and more evidence that the community would start to say, okay, I think Murphy's in the right. This guy's the thief, right? So either the guy agrees or not, and then I go to the judge and I get an official ruling, right? So I go, <laughs> tell you how stupid I am. I've been doing this talk forever, and I, was, I used to use Hans Hoppe as the legal thing, you know, and I saying, what am I doing? There's literally a judge who comes to me and says, you, I'll use him instead. All right. <laughs> this is the second year I've had that epiphany. All right. So have him issue the legal opinion. Okay. So again, it's not that the judge in this case is defining what the property title is. It's not that the judge has the authority to create my ownership and say, ah, I dictate or I issue a f by fiat, I declare that that TV is Murphy. No, he's saying the evidence I've seen in my understanding of property law relevant in this uh, context, the facts of the case, da, 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 in my opinion, I believe that yes, uh, the preponderance of the evidence comes down in favor that Robert Murphy is in fact the rightful owner, something like that. All right, so then I go, to, this is crucial, and this is where I think standard um, expositions on what's called anarcho-capitalism, I mean, not that they're wrong, but I, I think it's, um, I, empirical, I disagree empirically about how the markets would organize themselves, and I also think it sounds uh, more palatable to the outsider when we say it this way. I don't think it would be the same company that would decide who's in the right and then also execute enforcement of that decision. I think these would be separate things. The legal opinion's one thing, and then the, the agency that has big, strong people with you know, flak jackets and whatever, and those, those big plastic you know, things that police use so they, they get you know, uh, protection shields and so on, I think those would be separate agencies. I mean, they're, they're quite distinct functions, so I don't see why it would happen to be the same agency. So I would need, just take his ruling, his opinion, and then go to one of those reputable agencies and say, look it, here's this. Now will you come and, and get my TV? And then they say, sure, okay. So then they send in the, the goons to come get it. <laughs> it's Tom DiLorenzo. It's hard to see in the back because of the lighting, but it's Tom DiLorenzo, all right. So <laughs> you see how that's, that's different. So again, that company, so how, how does he stay in business? Either him as a sole proprietor, as like an expert at large, or working for a law firm, by issuing, fair, uh, issuing rulings that are quite fair in the eyes of the community. If it were ever discovered that one of the sides in a case was slipping him money under the table, and that's why he was, he'd be out of business, right? So I can't guarantee that won't ever happen, but the penalties to him, the incentives for him, are a lot swifter and surer than they would be for a government or you know, a state system where the judges are, either they have to win an election every once in a while or they're appointed by, by the political process. Okay, because it's not that you get rid of corruption by having politics be involved. Obviously not. And then how would these people stay in business, right? The people who take, so for one thing is they wouldn't act on cases that hadn't been decided upon by a reputable judge, 
or some, you know, some other entity that was known to give uh, trustworthy legal opinions, right? They wouldn't just go bash down somebody's door because some client showed up with a bunch of money and said, hey, I need 10 guys with guns. Come on, we're going. That's, they, they would not be a big, reputable company in the community. There might be a little petty gangs and so on, just like there are right now. I'm not saying that thing would be unheard of, but to be a big, reputable company that people just know, oh, that's where you go to have an enforcement of a, of a ruling to retrieve stolen property, they would only act on you know, inform rulings done by reputable judges. Also notice, when they, when they do kick in the door, so are they going to like send in chemical weapons that have been banned in international warfare that might kill any children in the house? Probably not, right? And what, what I'm alluding to is that that's what uh, you know, the BATF Janet Reno did back with, with Waco. If you, if you don't know what that is, just go look that up, all right? Um, so all sorts of horror stories about police, what's called police overreaction, police you know, doing things too aggressively. I'm not talking about necessarily cases of brutality, but just where they use more force than they really need to to bring somebody into custody, things like that. That sort of stuff, even whether or not it's legal or not in this world, right? Maybe there would be some sort of thing where the legal code would say, ah, oh, yes, if you're trying to enforce a just property decision and the person resists or gets in your way, you're even if that's it, they're going to go out of business, right? Because it just looks bad. It's If you send in a bunch of people and there's a 15-year-old sitting there playing video games and he says, hey, what do you got? And they say, shut up. And they just you know smack him and knock, knock him out and he goes to the hospital. That's not good for business, whether or not that the person gets in legal trouble for doing that, right? Certainly the company is going to get rid of the person and the, the company is, you know, is going to engage in better training and so on. I don't think they're going to use you know, particularly strong-arm tactics. I think they will try to just resolve the situation as peacefully as possible. Okay, so it, because of competition. All right, so that's how I would I'd handle that sort of case. Now let me move on here. I know there's all sorts of questions just from the, the TV example, but let me move on to hit some other topics. So would there be prisons in a free society? So on one hand, that seems like an, you know, an oxymoron. That seems impossible. How could it be a free? But on the other hand, you say, well, wait a minute. When we say free in this context, what do I mean? I'm saying a society where the default presumption is we always respect people's property rights. We never try to steal or aggress against somebody. And you might say, well, okay, then everybody's for a free society. No, they're not. Everyone is not for a free society well, they are, except you'll say, oh, so even when it comes to state employees, and they'll say, well, what do you mean? I say, okay, so you agree, like, if I don't support the stuff the U.S. Empire is, or the military is doing overseas, I lowered the deck there, if I don't support the stuff the U.S. military is doing overseas, I don't want to pay for that, you know, so I'll just, I just will reduce my taxes, right? He said, no, of course not, You're, we're going to take more, and if I don't pay, then ultimately people will come and throw me in a cage, right? So there, it's not that they think I've broken any other laws, you know, committed crimes against my neighbor or so on. It's just, I refuse to pay for a service that I never agreed to. So that's what I mean when I say a free society is one in which that sort of thing doesn't happen. It certainly doesn't happen institutionally the way it happens in a, a statist society, or right? one that has coercion as a central element in it, not just as something that happens once in a while and we try to minimize it. So in a society like that, could there be prisons? I think there would be a lot less of it than there is in any kind of state analog given the same type of people. So with all this stuff also, I know that I'm trying to throw a lot of information at you. Let me say while I'm thinking of it, with all these things, you want to be doing apples to apples. You want to say the same type of people with their value system, their proclivities to violence, their willingness to you know, engage in, in, in public discussions before they you know, rush to use their guns to settle a matter. Hold those things constant and just say, would a group who believes in the state versus ones who say, no, we, we just, we can't use that. That's unacceptable. It's immoral. We, we refuse to anoint this group that has monopoly, coercive power over the rest of us. Those two groups, and then how would things play out? That's really the issue. So I think the free society analog of those same, that same population of people, there would be a lot fewer people in prison per capita. But if it were to happen, how would it happen so here, I don't think we need to get tied up with the question of, well, gee, how would, um, you know, like from a natural rights perspective, it's kind of tricky to say, how can you go like tackle somebody and put them in a vehicle and then put them in a cage and hold them there for 10 years and not hold them there for eight 
Like that's not enough, but 10 is the right number, or holding there for 15, right? It's a lot of the stuff we think of in terms of imprisoning people, it seems kind of arbitrary. And so I think there is a big problem there in terms of standard libertarian punishment theory and how would you get that to pop out of the other end of the, of the uh, analysis. So I think fortunately, you don't need to worry about that. That just remember in a free society, every piece of land, every square meter is owned by somebody, right? And so everybody clearly has the right to say who can and cannot be on my property. So if there's some guy running around and the judge has ruled that, yes, you know, all these people we keep finding dead, we think it's this person, he's a serial killer, then you as a store owner can say, I don't want you in my mall. You know, just the whole serial killing thing, you know, I'm, <laughs> hey, more power to you, but just I don't want you in my, on my property, okay? I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong, just not on my property, right? <laughs> Everybody can say that all the apartment, you know, no one has to rent them an apartment. They would be pariahs. Okay, so again, now you can, we can talk about the, the family members of the deceased. Can they hunt them down? Yeah, there's all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not minimizing, but I'm saying clearly you can say if there's some wanted criminal and people know this person has been ruled by a reputable court to be guilty of, of murder, multiple counts of murder, no one's going to hire them. No one's going to sell food to them. So get out of here, right? So there'll be social pariahs. So what would happen to those people? I'm saying there would be oases of uh, relative, you know, guarded freedom, if you will, where companies would arise and they would say, hey, people like that, you can come here. Now we're going to pat you down and give you a new outfit or whatever, make sure you're not smuggling weapons in or whatever. We might have you, you know, heavily restrict your movements. But when you come in here, you can work and you know, we'll, we'll interview, see your skills. We'll provide you with a workstation, what have you. And you can be here. All right, and we'll try to rehabilitate you, in particular like if it's a religious or sort of philanthropic organization. But it could also just be a profit-maximizing business. There could be people out there who have good job skills, it's just they have anger management issues, right? <laughs> and so it's just like, you, you know, you, you want to build a bridge that way? What do you, you know? But the guy's a really good engineer. It's just you don't want to be around him when you disagree, all right? So there could be places like that where they could earn money, right? Because think of it right now, it's so wasteful. What the state system does. You've got people sitting there breaking rocks or making license plates, right? I mean, it's just, that would drive you crazy too. You think we're going to reform somebody, you know, have them doing completely useless things. Well, they, they know they did something wrong, right? And so in this kind of framework, there might be this big pending judgment and say, yes, you killed this person. You owe that person's estate, whatever, $400,000, okay? And so now maybe you work that debt off and you live in this restricted thing because the community doesn't trust you but maybe once you pay the thing off and you're a perfectly model citizen inside this community for 10 years, psychologists sign off on it. Maybe then you get you know, more and more freedom. Other places have degrees of, okay, yeah, you can be over here. Some elementary school is not going to hire you to be a third grade teacher, right? But maybe you can live in an assembly line. You're working in an assembly line and live in an apartment where there's other adults and they know the, the situation. Okay, you get the idea. I think that system would be much more humane and would be truly more likely to rehabilitate people because they actually could feel like they paid their debt and could get on with their lives. Whereas what the state does right now, you do some petty crime, you get thrown in a cage mixed in with people who are killers, right? That's not going to, that's going to mess you up and the guards don't protect you in there, right? That's, that's a horrible system, right? Designed to just produce more crime. Okay. The other thing about this is it's kind of like the Hotel California. All right. So, <laughs> but notice there's competition here. Okay, and so there's not going to be the guards beating up prisoners because if there were, the people would just go to a competing place, right? It's these places are trying to attract residents. Okay. All right, so yeah, I'm, it's like a prison, but it's a very odd type of prison where the people want to be there because they know at least I can be here and, and people will let me step on this property and not think I'm a pariah. Okay, in two minutes, I'm going to do private defense. You guys ready? Hold on. Okay, it's now, so the private law, I said that's the hard part. Private defense, again, go to my uh, pamphlet, Chaos Theory, to get this. It's insurance companies, right? How does that work? So a picture a big city, like New York City, insurance company, if, if a big skyscraper burns down, how, what do you, you have fire insurance. Okay, so what if there's a chance that some outside uh, country, state is going to have their battleships come in and start shelling it? You could have insurance to protect against that. So that's where the funding would come from. You don't need taxation. You could have billions of dollars going through big, huge companies from people buying insurance against being invaded by a military or having your stuff blown up or being you know, captured or killed. 
from an outside military, whether state or private, and then it would be the insurance companies now that would have the incentive to go ahead and fund things, you know, missile-based uh, land or, or surface-to-air missiles, things like that. I don't think there would be huge standing armies. They certainly wouldn't have swastikas. That would just be horrible for business. Why would they do that? <laughs> but I don't think there'd be large standing armies. Be, just why would you? You wouldn't need them. That, that would be crazy. Just like in general, businesses try to produce their services and products with as little manpower as possible to keep labor costs down. All right? So the, the whole enterprise of military defense, I think in a private setting, you'd have all the advantages of economic calculation and, and so forth in that setting. All right, you'd have competition. There would be prices. So let's say there's an outside state that's getting ready to invade. The insurance companies would run the numbers and they would say, okay, uh, we've got bi hundreds of billions of dollars of our insured client, our pr client's property insured on the line here. We stand to lose hundreds of billions, us as the insurance company. So you know what, if somebody could knock out one of those enemy choppers, we would be willing to pay $15,000 for that. We've run the numbers, that's how much it would help us. If somebody takes out one of their infantry, we would pay up to $1,200 for that. So there would be market prices, bounties, on the opposing forces, and it would be specific, and it would be quantitative, and the numbers wouldn't be arbitrary. They could run it and say, oh, because you know they can do this much damage to our stuff. And, that's, and, and lives would also have a property value, too, in terms of the, the insurance, life insurance. Okay, so that's where the numbers would come from. You would get market competition. Different firms would enter. Last thing I'll say, you wouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. For some reason, people say, oh, a bunch of people who read Rothbard, this little group of anarchists, how would they have stopped Nazi Germany? Well, they wouldn't have. But France didn't stop Nazi Germany either, okay? So <laughs> it's having a state doesn't make you stronger. It doesn't make your troops better. It doesn't make them shoot better. It doesn't give you more tanks, right? We know in any other area, having the state in charge cripples it, and the same would be true here. All right, thanks, everybody.